I, I love it when the program changes and we get such a distinguished guest. Please, maybe, maybe I was by it's quite possible that you've okay. replaced somebody else and I have an, in, an inaccurate... It usually happens in Ukraine. Well, the thing about yes is that it's, uh, it's never boring. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to um, be discussing uh, an extremely grave subject, and that is crime and punishment, war crimes, genocide, uh, and tribunals. Uh, we have an extremely distinguished panel. As I've already mentioned, we have the president of Latvia, uh, Egils Levitz, a lawyer, uh, and a former a judge at the European Court of Human Rights, a co-author of the preamble to the Constitution of Latvia. Uh, we have the, let me get this right, the Prosecutor General of Ukraine, uh, who is in an extraordinarily important uh, position, given the topic under discussion. We're also joined, on my far right, your far left, by Sir Geoffrey Nice QC, a British barrister and a judge, professor of law at Gresham College, who took part in the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia uh, and therefore was a lead uh, in the trial of Slobodan Milosevic, the former president of Serbia. He's also involved in two important initiatives, the China Tribunal and the Uyghur Tribunal, for which he's been personally sanctioned by the Chinese government. I don't think anybody in this room can be in any serious doubt that war crimes have been committed uh, by Russian forces in Ukraine. If you didn't see the exhibit out there, I urge you to look at it. It identifies or lists over 7,000 civilians uh, who've been killed, including nearly 400 children, and it, it identifies 20, by my count, 20 incidents, uh, including the shooting of civilians in Butcher, where some of us went yesterday. Actually, the exhibit, I think, understates the extent of the violence. Uh, and reading some uh, journalism late last night by my friend Jonathan Littell in Le Monde, I was forcibly reminded of just how horrific the massacres have been, and not only in Butcher. So I want to begin with some history to give us some perspective uh, before we get into the specifics of the Ukrainian situation. And so, Jeffrey, can I begin with you? I'm not a lawyer, and I suspect only a few of the people in this room are lawyers. <clears throat> what are the lessons of history when it comes to war crimes tribunals? In some ways, this is a, a subject that dates back to Nuremberg and Tokyo, to the famous uh, trials at the end of after World War II. I'm trying to think about the correct way forward for Ukraine at a time when the war isn't over and one can't count on the collapse of the Putin regime. Let's begin with the lessons of history for Ukraine. Probably the best way to approach this problem is to look at it from the point of view of those with the greatest interest. Who are they? The victims and the bereaved. They will have a conception of justice to which the law, lawyers and judges should respond if they possibly can. They, I have no doubt, will want accountability. They will want to see Putin dealt with in some way, preferably tried, punished. When will they want that accountability process to happen? Very soon. They will not want it to disappear into future decades. Where will they want it disposed of? I might be wrong, but I would think they would want it dealt with here, in Ukraine, if that can happen. 
Remember what President Zelensky said yesterday about home, about protecting home. What happens at home is your responsibility. The state has both the privilege and the duty to deal with bad things that happen at home, including crimes. And my guess is, if at all possible, the victims and the bereaved would want accountability processes to be dealt with here, and even, as I would think, in the Ukrainian and, as necessary, the Russian languages. If I'm right about that account of what those interested with want, can it be delivered? Not very easily. Ideally, if the national law includes relevant crimes, and I'm not still sure whether it does have universal crimes on the statute book, if it does, then in theory, Putin could be tried here if anybody would hand him over, but then he would claim head of state immunity, and you'll need the cleverest of your lawyers, and why not, to try and undo that nonsense. Because it is a nonsense for somebody who goes out to commit crimes against your country, then to be able to claim that because he was head of state, he doesn't have to be held accountable. Second, the ICC. It does have jurisdiction um, and is apparently investigating. What we need to hear from Mr. Karim Khan is whether he's investigating Putin, whether he's going to issue an indictment. If he does issue an indictment, think of its additional value, highlighted by the person who brought me here a few weeks ago from IWPR, Tony Borden. He says, makes this point. The indictment alone will make it harder for the coalition supporting Ukraine to start to separate. One member won't be able to say, oh, I think we've had enough of supporting Ukraine if there's an indictment out against its leader. That is very important. And then there's the question, which will be answered, I suspect, in more detail by others, of the special tribunal to deal with aggression. Aggression can't be dealt with by the ICC for absurd reasons that reflect an old-fashioned but revived concept of sovereignty favored by the likes of President Trump, but that should not be favored by anyone else. And that, sovereign, that concept of sovereignty is saving um, Russia, or in particular Putin, from aggression trial. I must finish, because I've taken too long already, but the last point about that possibility. If it is sufficiently supported by the international community, it's not a bad idea. It's a good idea. But remember that engaging any international activity, even the ICC and particularly a new concept, newly conceived tribunal, may build in delay. It will also bring in international participants who may exercise power over the way things are resolved. So it's a good idea, but approach it with great caution. And coming back to the first or nearly the first point I made, the most important thing for the people of Ukraine, in my judgment, is to have Putin's accountability dealt with firmly, definitively, unarguably, as soon as possible. And perhaps later I'll be allowed to explain why I say that is so important. Pre President uh, Levitz, let me now turn to you. And, and following on from what Sir Geoffrey said, what is the right institutional channel in your view, considering that we're talking about trying to bring to justice the president of a huge empire with a nuclear arsenal and a permanent seat on the United Nations Security Council. I mean, how does one do that? And which is the right institutional channel in your view? Uh, thank you. First of all, I would say we should uh, realistically calibrate our expectations to international law. International law is not so perfect as national state law. We are all uh, coming from states which are based on the rule of law and we are expecting that, that uh, uh, the law is perfect and a criminal is brought before the court. It is not so obvious 
in international law, because international law is, uh, as I said, not perfect, and for the victims especially, as I said, it could be a disappointment. But nevertheless, international law is, to, uh, is uh, absolutely necessary in order to keep the peace in the world. Uh, to, uh, to preserve uh, the principles of uh, United Nations Charter, which is the basis, this is con world constitution, I would say. And therefore, it is despite the, uh, the fact that the international law is not perfect, we, we should do all possible in order to uh, keep the law and to, uh, to uh, let the, uh, the law work. And I would say, uh, first, there are two international courts which are already dealing with uh, Russian aggression against uh, uh, some aspects of Russian aggression against Ukraine. It's International Court of Justice. There is a, a request of Ukraine against, uh, against uh, Russia not for the crime of uh, the war, of aggressive war, but for, uh, uh, for a misinterpretation of the Genocide Convention. It sounds a little bit strange, but it is the way how to bring the case before the International Court of Justice. Latvia joined uh, already uh, the, U uh, the Ukrainian uh, request, and a few days ago, ago also United States joined it. Can so, you clarify uh, something for me? Hmm? The, that sounds quite technical, misinterpretation of the uh, Convention on Genocide. Does that amount to accusing Russia of genocide? Explain. No, it is, uh, from a judicial point, a rather complicated issue. It would, be go to, it would go too far to explain that this uh, judicial nuances, but this is a way how uh, Ukraine can... Uh, reach that the International Court of Justice is dealing with these aspects of the war. Uh, if, if, we had, if we would have a little bit more time, I will explain, but I will go further. International Court of Justice is already dealing with some aspects. International Criminal Court is also uh, already dealing, and Mr. Khan, a prosecutor, is, uh, is investigating. Latvia has also, is uh, uh, helping him in order to, uh, to hear witnesses and so on and so on. But, uh, as I said, uh, the main crime, the crime of aggression, uh, there is till now no international court which can deal with this main uh, international crime. International Court of Justice is dealing with aspects, International Criminal Court with aspects. But uh, there is a possibility to, uh, to create a special tribunal. We have, uh, we have uh, some precedents, UN uh, special tribunals on Yugoslavia, for example, or, or uh, on Rwanda or Cambodia, or uh, on the murder of uh, previous Lebanese prime minister, and, and Sierra Leone, Liberia, and so. There are international tribunals. It could be established by United Nations, uh, not by Security Council for obvious reasons, in principle by General Assembly, but it's not very likely. So, but uh, there are realistic way how to establish such a tribunal is by uh, international agreement of like-minded states, Five states, 20 states, 50 states. Uh, this is one, one uh, way. The other way is to establish by, uh, already, by an already existing international organization. I would say Council of Europe is a candidate for that. Uh, with, a, with, a, with a majority of, of the votes, so there are 47 member states and 24 would be enough. So, and I think this idea should be put forward for, uh, for, uh, uh, for it's absolutely necessary because if United Nations Charter state, stated that uh, this is international law and non-aggression is a basis for international peace, 
then there should be an international court who can deal with this and uh, end with a legally uh, reasoned judgment. And this, I think, would strengthen international law. Not to do so means that we somehow accepting this violation and this ac somehow accept, I would say, by international community would also lead to further disintegration of international law, which is basis for peace. I, I repeat, basis for peace is uh, international law uh, as provided for in the Charter of 45 by United Nations. And therefore, I, uh, I strongly support the idea to establish an international special tribunal for, uh, which deals with uh, Russian aggression against Ukraine, special tribunal, at least by uh, like-minded states, the number of states, of course, if more states it would have more, so to say, political weight, but also, uh, also we should start with that. And I think there are enough states which are ready. We should take the initiative in order to establish such a special tribunal. Uh, that would be uh, my, my, my uh, proposal, practical proposal. And one, one small remark to what, what you said uh, concerning uh, the leaders of uh, Russia. I, uh, I think already in Nuremberg Tribunal, Nuremberg Tribunal was one such special tribunal in international law, established only by four states, four states, but uh, with a huge impact in international law. And uh, the chain of command and uh, responsible is uh, all members of the chain of the command from the first, from the leader, to the last uh, executor of, of the crimes. And I will rem remind us also to the judgment of International uh, uh, Court of, uh, of International, of European Court of Human Rights in the case Krenz, the last president of Germany. And there was two, two persons which uh, uh, were accused, the president Krenz and one soldier who shot uh, a refugee. So the whole, ch whole, uh, the whole command of chain from the first person to the last person were, were found responsible. I think this is a very, very important judgment concerning the whole responsibility of all persons which are involved. Uh, and of course, uh, such a proposal, I think uh, we should go further in order to establish such an international tribunal. Thank you. But Mr. President, with all due respect, uh, in the case of, of Nuremberg or in the case that you've just mentioned of the former East German uh, government, those events happened after the governments had fallen. There had been regime change. And that meant that you had access, not least, to documents that could show responsibility, could demonstrate the chain of command. I don't see how your proposal can be meaningful, could produce anything other than a kind of legal theater, as long as President Putin is in power and the Russian Federation remains the kind of regime that, that we see today. I, I would love to get an answer to that question. I'm an historian and therefore somewhat more skeptical about the power of international law than international lawyers. How do you do this if Putin's still in power? Yes, I think uh, the main reason for this uh, tribunal for uh, the execution of international law is not to bring someone to jail. This is a second and third a reason, but not the first reason. The first reason is to, as, to re-establish the law. And this could uh, also be known also in, in our systems of rule of law that there are also trials in absentia. That does not mean if someone is hiding, then it is not possible to, 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 to uh, uh, deal with uh, that before the court. I think, uh, uh, it's indeed, your examples uh, show 
uh, that till now, uh, the, in the cases like, like this, there was after the events. But uh, there is uh, no principle that uh, forbid us uh, to do it during uh, the events and even if uh, the, uh, the persons in power are still in, pow in power. Because uh, in, in, on the contrary, the principles uh, of international law deserves that. And I would say we should, uh, as law-obeying states, societies, should do all possible in order to preserve the law, to keep the standards of international law. If we are not doing so, we are lowering the standards by practice. And uh, therefore, uh, I think this is, uh, would be a very good sign. And I would say also that law or judgments are also strong arguments in politics. They are not only legal arguments, they are political arguments too. And uh, I would uh, only uh, support this in order to, for three reasons. Also, for the first reason, to be uh, honest with our principles. Second reason uh, is to keep the standards of international law, not to allow this practice to lower the standards. And third standards, it is a very important political argument, not the only one, but bit, uh, amongst other arguments, which uh, are promoting the international order, standards of law, and also the international peace order. International peace order is based on international law. So, thank you. Thank you, and let me now turn to uh, Andrei Kostin to get the Ukrainian perspective on this. Uh, you've heard it suggested that, that we need some kind of new international tribunal, not a UN entity, but some coalition of the willing can create it so that there can be prosecution of Russia for aggression. What is, is that the kind of thing that the Ukrainian government would welcome, or is your strategy different? Thank you for your question. Um, I totally agree with a lot of arguments with which my fellow colleagues uh, mentioned today. And uh, I think it's not only about a political will of Ukrainian political leadership at the moment. It's the will of every Ukrainian. I usually, when I talk to my partners, my fellow prosecutor general of our partner states, and uh, representative of different international organizations, I usually tell our esteemed ambassadors, I usually tell them that Ukrainians will not accept if there will be no tribunal for the crime of aggression. And the crime of aggression, as we say, it's mother crime. It was the first committed by Russians. So I don't hear heard as of today any real argument against the necessity and against the possibility to have the tribunal for the crime of aggression. I heard a lot of arguments. Money. No problem. We find money at the end of the day. Ukrainians will find money if necessary. When I hear that, you know, um, whom shall we try? Nobody wants the tribunal in absentia. But I, first of all, I totally agree with President Levitz. It's not only about having real people before the trial. We would like to have them. We don't know when war ends. We hope as soon as possible with our victory. And it means that some of these people who are related, who are, uh, the, represent the higher level of Russian military and possibly even political leadership, 
would be somehow catched, detained, and then sent to this tribunal. But what we need to do at the moment, we need to be prepared. I also heard before that, you know, the ICC, it's, we need to support, it's uh, about the war crimes, the crime of genocide and crimes against humanity. Totally agree, and we are in a very close contact with Prosecutor Han. The parliament uh, have adopted law. Now, the, one more law is, uh, should be adopted in, you know, coming weeks in order to make easier to Prosecutor Han's team to work here on the ground, and we will do it. And we, in, uh, every day we are in close contact and exchanging information about particular cases which we want to send to The Hague. But we are very cautious because I will tell you now as not, or maybe even as a prosecutor general, Ukrainian nation cannot allow us to lose the cases in the International Criminal Court. And prosecutor Han understand the same. So we need to be very careful and send the strongest cases there. And this is extremely important. But coming back to the tribunal, we have time. We have time to prepare it. We don't know if it will be after war event, as it, as it was before all the time in history, or during the war. It doesn't matter. We need aggressor to be punished. And this is the position, I believe, of all Ukrainians. I, I wanted to start, you know, with like words of usual, I'm sorry to say, manipulation with the audience, asking you to raise hands if you all agree that uh, crime of aggression was committed, but I believe that all of you would raise these hands. So if we all believe in, I don't think that we can, you know, really uh, afraid or, um, really go deep into concern that could uh, not allow us to have this tribunal. So, one more difference between the attitude of, from our partners to the ICC and to the tribunal. We understand that helping, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not cynic now, but we are in war. Helping, providing assistance to the ICC financial, political, and ex expert assistance, which is provided by broad coalition of our partners. This not somehow link politically these governments with the outcome, with the judgment, future judgment of the ICC, since the ICC is the independent international judicial institution, and it would be like this all the time. But coming back to the crime of aggression, it, it is understandable now that it needs to be political decision taken, either to join this uh, platform with the help of the Council of Europe, for instance, or European Union, or if we will go on the, neck, on the other track, having an international multilateral agreement, agreement in order to uh, make this Tri tribunal at on ad hoc level and what I'm sorry to uh, I will finish and what many Ukrainians think that if some big players are not now actively supporting the idea of tribunal to prosecute and to punish the crime of aggression maybe it means that they would leave open door for future normalization of relations with Russia. Because coming back to history, usually we think that tribunal is a post-war event. And it could be like this. So I openly tell them that Ukrainians will not understand such approach. So that is why this is important. So th this raises a really interesting question. If, if Ukraine is going down, as it were, both roads, the ICC and the idea of an international tribunal on, a, on aggression, does it have the full backing of its principal ally at this point, the United States, which doesn't, of course, 
uh, recognize the International Criminal Court. Uh, this is a question I'm not going to put to you. I'm actually going to go to the floor because we have here uh, Andrei Smirnov, Deputy Head of the Office of the President, and I'd like to get his thoughts on this because this is a more political question. Uh, are you being encouraged by Washington to take this approach, or is this very much your own Ukrainian initiative? Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Ukraine is not encouraged, but either Washington or any other capital city. And I agree with all of the esteemed speakers in the panel. But the issue of setting up a special uh, tribunal to investigate the crime of aggression is not a purely Ukrainian matter. It is a matter of the maturity of the civilized world, the maturity that the world lacked back in um, uh, 2008, when uh, Russia committed aggression against Georgia, that is the maturity that the world lacked back in 2014, when Russia came to Crimea, to Donbass, and the matter on our plate is a matter of the existence of the civilized world. And I'm sure that our competent authorities, Prosecutor General's Office and investigatory authorities will uh, bring this investigation to the logical end. And the issue that we have to address all together is uh, the uh, issue of our bravery to call criminals criminals until they come to your countries uh, with their weapons. There is no rational alternative to the existence of the special tribunal. We have weighed all of the risks. Uh, the uh, UN uh, Security Council, the General Assembly, and we do rely on their political support, at least. And we are fully aware that uh, we would not be uh, going on the turf of the International uh, Criminal Court. I ICC. What we ask the world to do is to set up a specialized tribunal on the uh, crime of aggression, just to call a spade a spade, if you wish. The crime of aggression, as uh, the prosecutor general said, is a mother, mother of crimes. And all of the facts have been documented by both Ukraine and our international partners. We do know the culprits and uh, their henchmen, and we should not need till the end of the war. We do not uh, um, have to wait till Ukraine wins until we start doing something. Of course, I can imagine a, a future in which all that you have proposed happens and the next day uh, Russia and China announce uh, their international tribunal to prosecute the United States government for some other war that they will say was a war of aggression. So one understands, I think, the dangers in going down this road. We'll soon have competing international tribunals conducting a retrospective investigations into other wars. But I understand exactly the motivation uh, in Ukraine uh, for doing this. And perhaps in order to, to get a sense of why that motivation is so strong, and I think we're all now aware from uh, both of your contributions how passionately Ukrainians feel about this. I'm going to call uh, on Ivan Fedorov, uh, the former mayor of Militopol, who's sitting just behind you, uh, if you can pass the microphone uh, to him. Uh, Ivan Fedorov uh, was a victim of a war crime. Uh, he was uh, kidnapped uh, by Russian forces uh, early in the conflict, uh, he was subjected to uh, psychological, at least, torture, uh, was released in March after, a, I think, a prisoner exchange. How do you think about this question? As somebody who has first-hand experience of mistreatment by Russian forces, Thank you very much for giving uh, the floor to me. I would like to draw your attention to two things. First of all, war crimes are not only about killings. Uh, 
and whatever uh, is going on on the ter uh, temporarily uh, occupied territories are also war crimes when uh, people have no freedom of expression, when people have no freedom of movement, uh, nor do they have the right to the freedom of thought even. People are being exterminated, uh, being abducted, and we have uh, no, uh, come to know several facts when children um, are abducted, when people cannot leave the temporarily occupied territory of their free will, which runs counter to the international humanitarian law, including all conventions. And it is um, also a war crime as well as uh, the purposeful killing. And we will be documenting those crimes after deoccupation, like in Bucha, in Nirpin, elsewhere. And that's understandable because it gives us access to the evidence. But uh, today, in the temporarily occupied territories, you haven't got the access to this evidence, particularly physical evidence. But we nonetheless should start doing doing this work, documenting uh, those crimes, interviewing witnesses. And I would also like to draw your attention to a small part of uh, uh, Ukrainian society, uh, the so-called collaborationists who agreed to cooperate, collaborate with the enemy. And uh, they should be stripped of everything, of all of the arrests that they have in the territory of Ukraine, of any support by the state. Uh, and when they want to transfer uh, the assets into the ownership of their kin, next of kin or their friends, all of that should be stopped because they should know that they would be punished for their crimes. Today, as matters stand, they are sure that they will never be brought to account. And we have to do our utmost for them to be brought to justice timely as soon as possible. And that will be just a very good dissentive uh, for people who think of doing uh, something like that. There would be no impunity. Can I ask you, Mr. Kostin, uh, that raises a really interesting question. How many people do you think fall into that category of collaborators? And does this mean that there will have to be a large-scale process of prosecution of people who were, in effect, a fifth column supporting the Putin regime? Um, as a citizen of Ukraine, in some times, in some cases, when I see, see the file of potential collaborator, let's say like this, I really don't understand how these people can assist our enemy aggressor in the way they do, sending the coordinates, which after that, People, children are killed. I don't understand because you, when you see this file, it's, it's absolutely unacceptable for you as a human being. But the other part of me as a person with, you know, like 24 years of practicing attorney career, I saw everything. So the number of these people is substantial. Of course, we have a lot of information every day about the p people who could be potential collaborants. And our law enforcement agencies and prosecutors work with these files as a matter of priority. Yesterday, actually, we have two cases where one person was detained uh, in Dnipro, she worked in a, let's say, military facility, and she sent information about the work of this military facility and also coordinates to the aggressor. The second case is still not public, but it also relates to, to, to collaborants. So these cases, traitors and collaborants, is uh, one of the top priorities of my 
activity and law enforcement. We're almost out of time, so I'm going to have to ah. stop you there. Lawyers are famously long-winded. We've got three minutes, uh, and so what I'm going to do is ask just uh, two of you to say very briefly what you think the biggest problem, the biggest challenge is going to be in executing the kind of strategy that we now understand the Ukrainian government has. And, and, and let me uh, begin, uh, first of all, with, with President Levitz. What's the biggest problem, do you think, in, in bringing the perpetrators of aggression and other war crimes to justice? The first step is to establish such a tribunal. I don't see that there is a problem which is uh, uh, very, uh, which uh, hinders that. Uh, I mentioned uh, this judgment of Krenz against, uh, of, uh, pre against previous German president and one soldier. I was judged in the case, and uh, in, this, uh, in this case, it was especially mentioned 20 years ago that this judgment is a warning for all dictators and all aggressors uh, for, for the future. And I had not imagined that it would, uh, it would be so relevant now, 20 years later. But I think as a first step, it is, uh, it is doable. It is nothing that is not possible. There is necessary to have a political will to establish. Then, uh, I would uh, not say that, uh, that uh, to bring someone in the jail is the main reason. This is uh, not very important, I would uh, rather say. Very important is to preserve the international law. Because impunity, impunity means also invitation to further crimes. And we should prevent further aggressions, further crimes, also in order to, uh, to, um, to preserve the peace. And this is not the only one mean, not the only one instrument, but Mr. very important. Mr. Instrument. President, I must interrupt you there simply because otherwise there'll be no time at all for uh, Sir Geoffrey to give us a last word. One minute and 20 seconds, please, Sir Geoffrey. Biggest problem is getting everyone to understand it politicians in particular, that proving these cases is not as difficult as the lawyers might like you to believe. It is as clear as day that crimes against humanity have been committed. It's been clear that Putin is in charge from day three. Why? Because he has a television. He knows what has seen by the world about the targeting of wholly unlawful objectives. Have you heard him say publicly he did not authorize that? Have you heard him say publicly he called people back to be tried for committing what are so obviously crimes? No. Do not accept politicians and those who should support this new tribunal that these are difficult matters. Lawyers sometimes find difficulties when they don't exist. I've noticed These that. crimes are easily provable and must come before some court or tribunal as soon as can be. And a last word, I'm going to eat a minute of your coffee break because I, I think uh, Andre Kostin has a final word and I think it's appropriate that the last word should be Ukrainian, Andre. Thank you. And my last word is the following. Thank you, my, my dear colleagues and friends. And I would say to everyone, from the 24th of February, Ukrainians believe in unbelievable. We have a lot of cases which were unbelievable from the very first days, and now we understand that this is a reality. So we all believe that something unbelievable become true. And this is my last message to you today. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, everybody.